Good morning. Good morning. So good to see everybody. And, you know, I, we have such a wonderful uh, hospitality service uh, in the mornings prior to the church service that uh, thinking, uh, Christina, we might need to start putting a little bit of caffeine in what you bake. <laughs> Because we're starting, I, I think we're starting to see some of the after Thanksgiving dinner napping going on. I'm going to encourage. Other than that, other than that, I, I think it's fantastic. You guys, uh, make sure you grab a cup of coffee if you're going to get some of that food, because otherwise you're going to go into a food coma and you're going to miss everything. Uh, so thank you for being here this morning. Um, I'm Brian. I am the uh, the guy who comes up here and gives you God's word. Um, some people say I'm a pastor. I say I'm more just the guy who follows Jesus and points you in the same direction. Yeah. Amen. Uh, and so this morning we're going to run through some announcements. Some of them you've heard a hundred times. Uh, some of them might be new, but I want to start by reminding you about the fact that to connect with this church body, we use something called Text in Church. And Text in Church is where we have the opportunity to be connected with you through text message, through your smartphone. Uh, and, uh, you know, it really makes us uh, into a family where we can stay in touch. And so I want to encourage you uh, to take part in that if you haven't already. And all you need to do is text the word welcome to 719-735-8848. All right, moving on. Uh, we're going to jump into uh, Wednesday night's Bible study. It's uh, it's going and going and going, and it's it's great. It's picking up some steam with uh, moving into uh, Second John. Second John and Third. They're Se short. So Second John and Third John, and they and and in those particular uh, parts of Scripture, John is short, um, <laughs> and so we we want you to uh, to come to that and be a part of that and and understand that there is. Uh, an opportunity not only to learn, but, but to grow and, and to fellowship. So please come be a part of that. Backing up from Wednesday nights, uh, Monday nights, we have women's Bible study. You know, I really should put the women's slide ahead of the, uh, the Wednesday, Wednesday, next, next week. Um, my, my wife can help me remember that next week. Um, so the women's Bible study, Mondays, seven o'clock, um, typically, uh, it goes somewhere between from seven to somewhere between eight and eleven uh, and so uh, however that works for you uh, if you gotta if you gotta leave after 60 minutes great if you decide to stay the full two and a half hours that's awesome too uh, and so uh, it's uh, it's been a great thing and we are very blessed and so thank you for those of you who take, are taking part if you haven't had a chance to check it out please do guys you know uh, all right moving on impact um oh no we're going to team jesus next <clears throat> and so here's here's the way this works Team Jesus is the organization that we put together to support the Pregnancy Center by going and taking part in the Walk for Life. And so June the 3rd, Christ Church Bubba West will be having, this will be our third year, third year, I believe, uh, of, uh, of sponsoring Team Jesus. And what that means is if you would like to come and be a part of the walk, which is June the 3rd, um, please uh, see Joetta uh, after the service today. Uh, and uh, let, let her know you're interested, and we are going to have Team Jesus t-shirts this year. Uh, there'll be 15-ish dollars um, if you're interested. We haven't, we, a lot of it depends on how many there are ordered and, and, and where we actually have them printed, that sort of a thing, but we will have t-shirts to do with that. Right, I'm getting to that, and you know, uh, it, if it is, it's really good to have to have somebody help you remember your lines. And so I, I have my wife for that, and so I'm grateful. But the, the way the whole Team Jesus thing works is if you want to sign up, the way you do it is you go to Joetta to get on the list for the shirts, and then we will get you the link where you can go online and sign up to re and register for being a part of that. Now, quite honestly, Team Jesus is, a, I mean, the Walk for Life is a fundraiser. This is uh, an opportunity for us to uh, support ACPC and to encourage our friends and family to uh, chip in and to help with that. And, and I, I got to tell you, guys, I'm, I'm on the board of the FCA. I, I serve in leadership here. I, I've been on other boards, and I like walks way better than banquets. Um, so what, what I would encourage you to do is to be a part of something, whether you're a banquet person or a walk person, but jump in there somehow, some way, and we have a great time. And quite honestly, the walk lasts about 90 minutes. Uh, and and it's, it's, a, it's a great day. We, we walk around, we, we meet some folks, and we, we smile and we laugh, and we help save the children's lives. Amen. And so that's what it's about. All right, moving on. 
Um, we have impact. Our youth group is meeting uh, continually, uh, 5.30 to 7 o'clock. Uh, we have uh, gotten to some little bit warmer weather, so we are spending some time outside. However, can even on this last Thursday, with it being a little bit warmer, it wasn't so warm, was it? No, it wasn't. And so, young people, if you are going to be coming, please plan on being outside. We will be outdoors, even if it's a little bit chilly. So bring a jacket. Uh, those of you who showed up in shorts and t-shirts last week, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, and so, yeah, Mason, I'm talking about you, buddy. <laughs> so what we want to do is we want, we want you, you kids to remember, you guys, you young people, we are going to be outdoors. We are going to have some fun. We are taking advantage of that. It is, it is getting warmer, but we're going to, we're going to be outside. So, so keep that in mind. All right. Gear Up is going really, really well, and you might notice there's a new sign out there, and thanks to my father-in-law, Stanley, Stanley Gasnick over here, uh, we have a new sign out in front of the, the building, the, or the, the shipping right. So I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you real quick, um, Stan is a jack-of-all-trades, and uh, if it's broke, he, he can fix it, and he'll fix it in such a way that it ain't going anywhere. All right? And so he built our blessing box. He, he, uh, he refurbished the drop-off box for the gear up stuff that's right there in the parking lot, and he put this sign up. If we have a tornado and it takes the building and the shipping container away, those three things will still be here. Right? Thank you, Stanley. Uh, and, and, you know, honestly, I think... I think he would have beefed up this sign a little bit, but they don't make boards any bigger than what he used. So it just, we would have had that whole tree. Uh, so anyway, we, uh, we're, we're grateful. And, and uh, we had that banner, and we were trying to put it on the, the shipping container, and the wind just tore it up, and, and he gave us a solution. So we're, we're grateful for that. Uh, okay, and, and then uh, coming up, you, uh, you may know that we've got Vacation Bible School around here, and, and uh, we're really excited by what's going what's gonna to happen this year because last year was so encouraging. Uh, with the kids that we had show up, and, and this year we're going to plan for at least twice as many. Uh, and so uh, June Hammond has volunteered to help uh, get us organized and, and make things happen. And so we're looking for volunteers. Uh, you uh, you know um, who you are, um, all of you. Uh, and uh, we, we would like you to be a part of, of what's going to happen uh, come June. It will be in the evenings, so if having a job is no excuse, uh, unless you work in the evenings, and or if you, you know... Work overnight. Where did my brother-in-law go? Yeah, every when I start talking about volunteering, he leaves. And I see you out there, thank you, John. Uh, so anyway, um, we're uh, we're in, we're looking for that. We're going to do a, a sports theme. We're going to have a great time, and uh, we're looking for folks to plug in on all sorts of levels: food, art, uh, music. Um, and then the sports, obviously, so those kinds of things. So uh, if you've got uh, something that you would like to, uh, to volunteer to help with, please let us know. And we're going to have some uh, organizational meetings here in the, in the coming weeks to talk about what that is and then go from there. All right, the very last thing is I've been told that I, I have uh, forgotten to mention the fact that uh, we have changed, and it's probably a good idea to mention it every now and again, we have changed the way we do offerings. Uh, we have a, a box out there in the foyer uh, that is how we do our offerings uh, these days, and so uh, just to remind you that it's there. Uh, it's uh, it's got really cool lights in it. Um, it's uh, it's a great looking offering box, and uh, uh, I would encourage you to at least stop and admire it. Uh, and so we, we we are looking forward to uh, a wonderful service this morning. And you know what? All of those all of those announcements uh, don't. Pale. They pale in comparison to the true announcement, and that is that we are here because our Savior died for us. Amen. And so, right here, right now, just pause for a moment and let's invite the presence of God into this space. Lord, we are we are here knowing that you are living within us, and yet we ask that you would move forward through us this morning. May we feel your presence. May we glorify your name, and may you let your love flow through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. It's good to see y'all. Um, oh, yes. We found, or I found, an iPhone in the bathroom in the back. So if you're missing a pink iPhone, please see. Um, that's what I got. I got a pink iPhone. So if you're missing it, go ahead and see Brother Rick in the back. He's got it for you. Um, this morning, I'm going to ask you to bear with me. I'm getting over a 
cold, you know, that was spring cold. So, um, gentlemen, it is your time to shine because we dropped everything about two keys lower. <laughs> so, let me tell y'all, gonna be singing solo this morning, but we're gonna make a joyful noise. Psalms 100 says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Knowing ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. And his truth endureth to all generations. Amen. So let's keep that in our hearts this morning. and Give him thanks and praise this morning. Amen. Let's stand.
this morning, um, Brian's continuing on his sermon series, and last week he talked about surrender, and this week he's going to be talking about service. And um, when and so part of his sermon, he is taking from the book of Philippians. And I just want I just wanted to show you this is my favorite book of the Bible. One of them. <laughs> this is my this is my favorite. <laughs> and so, 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 um, so, kids, you can draw in your Bibles. <laughs> but so, as he was reading it, um, I always come back to this. It's so, so one of my favorite verses, and this isn't in his sermon, but it's uh, Philippians four. Oh, and the thing to keep in mind: when Paul wrote Philippians, he was in prison, but yet they call Philippians the book of joy. I mean, how cool is that? I mean. Yeah, so it just puts it in perspective that Paul was writing this while in prison, and if you can imagine, in biblical times, prison was probably not what it is today. And so, um, in so in Philippians four, verse six. No, actually, I'm going to do verse eight. I'm sorry, verse eight through nine. Um, Paul says, "And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing." Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you've learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. And so that's kind of what Brian's going to be talking about today is service and putting into action what God has instructed us to do. So, oh, and we want to pray for Haley today. She's in Florida, right? Yeah, national. Yeah, she's at the National DECA competition. So that's why we're missing um, Haley today. So keep her in your prayers as well. So pray with me. Father God, thank you so much for bringing us here this morning. Thank you for giving us the freedom. Actually, we need to stand up. You need to stand up. I gotta get the practice. You just told me to do that. Stand up, folks. Put those hands out. We're gonna receive his blessings. Put them out. Put them out. Very good. Thank you, thank you, thank you. God, we receive your blessings. We receive your blessings. Thank you for giving us the freedom to worship. Thank you for giving us a country where we have the opportunity to worship your most holy name. Yes. God, be with um Jacob, be with Brian as he as he gives your word, be with the worship team, as we worship your holy name. And Father God, help us to be an example. Help us to be servants. We know we are called to be servants. Give us a servant heart so that we can come and serve you and be an example of Jesus, your most wonderful and amazing life-giving son. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
So if you are fifth grade or younger and would like to come up and uh, hang out for a little bit, uh, you are welcome to do so. Yeah, I think we'll just do this. Oh, we got one more. All right. Um, Jim, would you scoop over one for me, please? I'm going to give you the dangerous seat. I don't know you can handle it. I'm going to sit you down, okay? Okay. All right. All right. Here's what we're going to do. Before we get started, everybody wave. Wave. Nice. I like that. So I... I, I I, I went to school at a place called the University of Iowa. After the first quarter of every football game, they pause, and all of the people on the stands, all of the football players for both teams, turn and wave to the kids in the children's hospital. Because they can see over the top of the stadium, into the stadium, from the top floors, and they're full of kids. And they do that, and you just waved to our kids. And that's pretty cool. All right, so this morning... Let's see if I can get my, my act together here. So this morning, I have some questions, and that's what I usually do, isn't it, Peyton? I ask a lot of questions, don't I? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. So when, 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 when we talk about things like that, uh, asking questions, you guys are really good at the answers. Now, Mary, when, when I ask you a question and you're not really sure, what's the good answer if you're not really sure what the answer is? Uh, <laughs> you remember, there, there, I, at one point I said, there is one answer that's always a good one to pull out there no matter what, if you don't know what the answer is, and that is Jesus. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so say it. Jesus. There we go. I knew you knew. All right, and so this morning, what I want to ask you, what does it mean if you put somebody else's needs ahead of yours? What, is that, what does that look like? Hey, so what does that look like? If you put somebody else's needs ahead of yours, give me an example of something you might do where you put somebody, what somebody else wanted ahead of what you want. Jesus. <laughs> Okay, we can all go home. <laughs> nice job. Nice job. Nice job. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That works. That works. You see why we do this? <laughs> you see why we do this? This is, this is good. I, um, yeah, the, the preacher learns as much as the kids do. I'm going to tell you. All right, and so, have you ever, raise your hand if you ever ate the last cookie. If the cookie, the, if the cookie's at home, if you ever ate the last one. Did you ever eat the last one? Right? Yeah. Did you ever, Mary, did you ever eat the last cookie? No, Mary never ate the last cookie. Okay. Oh. 
I'm not so sure. We're going to, yeah, okay, I'm not so sure that's the case. Mary, you had a, an escape shoot. There you go. Okay. So, if you ate the last cookie, does that mean that your brothers or your sisters didn't get to eat the last cookie? I did. Yeah, you did. So, but that's usually, so, so if you, if you saw there was only one cookie left and you let your brother get it, that would be putting him ahead of you, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah, that would be if you if you let if you let your brother have the last cookie instead of you because you know you, you you like to eat the last cookie, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. Do you like to eat the last cookie? Yeah. Yeah, of course he does. And so and do you like to eat cookies? Yes. Yes, of course. And so when you have the last cookie, you get a chance to decide: Is it going to be me, or am I going to give it to somebody else? What happens? What happens if you let your brother, one of your brothers, eat the last cookie. Do they like you more or less? More. More. They like you more because what? Be because you gave them it. Good. Right, exactly. Because you put them ahead of you, right? And so... Or you could just break it in half. Or you could just break it in half. That's very good. Very good. Okay. Very good. Mom, Mom she's learning. She's learning. And so... When, 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 you, when we talk about that, then you do something for somebody else. Is, is, it, is it a case where, Gio, if you do something for somebody else and put somebody else ahead of yourself, do you think they might do it for you somewhere down the road? Yeah. Yeah. And so if, in the Bible, it tells us that we want to treat other people the way we would want to be treated. Right? And so that is kind of the golden rule, to, to treat other people the way you would want to be treated. Okay, And so when we talk about what God's talking about in the Bible when it comes to those kinds of things, what he says is that he wants us to put other people ahead of ourselves because we know who it was that put other people ahead of themselves. Who was that, Mason? Jesus. Yes, I knew. <laughs> so Jesus, his whole life was designed around putting the needs of other people ahead of his own, right? He did that a lot. And so I want to tell you a story. There was a little girl who was nine years old, and she had a sister. It wasn't you. Uh, and, and she had a little sister, and every morning they would go to get on the bus, and they would have to walk across a street to get to where the bus was going to pick them up. And they would hold hands, and the, the nine-year-old girl would hold her little sister's hand, her little sister was five, and they would go across the street to where the bus was going to pick them up. One day, while they were walking across the street, a truck came, and that truck didn't stop. And so the older sister pushed her little sister out of the way, and she was the one that was hit by the truck. Now, the little sister was fine. The older sister ended up having some injuries, and she ended up being in the hospital for a while. But what she said was this. She said, I knew that my little sister couldn't take that kind of a hit, so I took the hit. She put her little sister ahead of herself. And so what God tells us to do is the same kind of thing. That in our lives, every single day, we need to see that other people are, in our minds, should be considered more important than ourselves. Okay, And we serve them in that way. Jesus came to serve. Now, there's a story about what Jesus did prior to when he went to the cross. He hung out with his friends, and they would have a, a, a tradition where you would wash feet. Because when you walked on the roads back then, they were like walking down a dirt road, and they would just do it in basically flip-flops. And so their feet would get dirty. And so when they would come into a place, they would have a, a basin of water, and they would have their feet washed, usually by a slave or a servant who was there to do that. Jesus, though, who was God, King of kings, Lord of lords, above all of us, got down on his knees and he washed everybody's feet because he put the needs of others ahead of himself. And that's what we want to do. All right? So, I got to tell you, I'm, I, I know this is, is, is something that they're getting. I know that this sinks in, but... Don't hold it against them if they rush to the candy bucket. Okay? Uh, they, 
All right, so let's see how this works. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for these awesome kids. I pray that you continue to bless them, that you give them a vision, that they would see what it looks like to be more like Jesus. May your Holy Spirit fill their hearts. May you protect them. May you watch over them. May you keep them safe. And may you use them to grow your kingdom. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's see. Who needs, first of all, who needs help now? You do. And you do. We've all heard stories of dramatic rescues. You know, the, the stories where a, an average Joe leapt into action and almost instantly became a hero in the face of some tragic event. These people, they discount their own safety and they put safety ahead of others, or put safety ahead of others ahead of their own. And sometimes they do this at great cost. Now, before I go any further, we're going to talk a little bit more about this. I want you to know that we have uh, some firefighters in our congregation who do this on a regular basis. And, and this is not to discount what they do. We are very grateful for what they do. But I will tell you this. I have met a lot of firefighters over the years. And the two that we have that are part of our church family are some of the most humble guys that there are. And they won't tell you about the things that they do day in and day out. And so we are grateful for them. And I don't want, don't want to pass that, pass that up or that opportunity to say that. So we are... We are grateful there. So let's. So anyway, these people, they, they discount their own safety and they put the safety of others ahead of their own. And sometimes it, it's, there's a price. They often spring into action without even taking into account or even taking a minute to consider what the, what the reason for them doing this is or what the possible cost to themselves is going to be when they do what is in front of them. It's almost as if it's instinctual in some people. They respond when someone is in danger. And quite honestly, you can't tell who these people are by looking at them a lot of times. It just happens. It's just kind of a of, a, of an instinct. And so 25-year-old Nick Bostick is just such a guy. And I want to take just a moment and have you watch this short video. In the face of raging flames, searing heat, and stifling smoke, 25-year-old Nick Bostick made a split-second, life-or-death decision. Caution be damned. <laughs> Monday, authorities in Lafayette, Indiana, say Bostick was driving through this neighborhood shortly after midnight. Spying the flames, he slammed the brakes and burst into the home, screaming for anyone inside to get out. I was just waiting for, for the house to explode. I've never, ever, ever done anything this before. Sprinting upstairs, Bostick woke four kids ages 1 to 18, guiding them outside, but learned a six-year-old girl was still trapped. Again, without hesitation, he dove back in. As firefighters arrived, Bostick was crawling through smoke toward the sound of a screaming child. He scooped her up and jumped through a second-story window, saving her life. What's going through your mind as you're trying to bust that window out? May God be with us, because we got to get the heck out of here. First responders went to work on his fractured arm. But through the pain, only one thing was on his mind. She was, thanks to Nick, who was airlifted to a hospital. If you uh, don't put Mr. Bossy on the scene for another two minutes, those children will find lost. Heroic actions in the heat of the moment. I was ready to lose my life that night. The very definition of courage under fire. Steve Patterson, NBC News. One of the things that I've learned over the years is that no matter what the story is that you're told or that you hear, there's always a little bit more to it. There's 
something in addition to what you have been told or that you read or that you watched. And so, uh, for instance, Nick here, it uh, turns out that uh, he was out that evening um, because he had been having a fight with his girlfriend. Uh, and he was driving around trying to clear his head. And he came upon this house that was in flames. He was quoted as having said that he believed that it was God's will that he was there at that place and that time. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that that was probably something he didn't consider until after the fact. And I can tell you that even... I can't tell you if Nick is a believer or not. We, we don't know that. But one thing I can tell you is that his passing that home at that particular time was no accident. It was not a coincidence. And you see, God knows Nick's heart. And those kids are alive today because Nick counted others more significant than himself. Now, two weeks ago, we celebrated the resurrection of our rescuer, Jesus Christ. He stepped out of heaven, coming to live with us, you may have heard the name Emmanuel. That's what he came to do. And Emmanuel means God with us. And Jesus came to do that. And he came to seek and he came to save the lost. And that just happens to be every single one of us. Okay? There is nobody taking breath that Jesus didn't come for. And so when we think about that, what a great thing to celebrate. I was recently asked what my favorite holiday is. And I have to say it's Easter. It hasn't always been the case. As a kid, I wasn't a big fan. As a kid, you, you look more towards what's under the tree than you're interested in what's or isn't in the tomb. And so I got to the point where as my faith grew, so did my love for Easter. It was Resurrection Sunday. Because there is this love and this hope that comes from knowing that the tomb is empty. And that resurrection story just can't be beat in my book. So then last week we talked a little bit about what we should do in response to the work of Jesus on the cross. Because of the love, the great love that he has for us, he was willing to suffer and to die so that you and I have an opportunity. We have a chance at eternal life should we decide. And that response, you remember what that response was? You remember? It was surrender. To surrender 100% of who we are, of our lives, to Jesus. It only makes sense when you think about it. I mean, when we really get, when we really get what it is that Jesus did, when we really grasp that and why he did it, there really is no other logical question, or I'm sorry, logical answer. So today we take that next step. We ask the question, what does it look like then to surrender? What does it look like to turn everything over to Jesus. I know, Jesus take the wheel. No, I'll tell you that's not right. It's much more than that. It's Jesus take my life, my heart, my career, my relationships, my future, all my stuff. Jesus take it all. And when we surrender like that, well, we just can't sit still. We just can't. The kind of surrender we're talking about is connected to obedience and it's connected to love. Now, I don't have this in my notes, but I, 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 there's a, a, an illustration that I want to share with you that I've used over and over again, and it's because it's a really powerful one and, and I think it gives us a good visual. There was a guy named Larry Walters. Larry Walters was somebody who had flying in his blood. He wanted to be a pilot. And so he tried and tried and tried to get into the Air Force. They wouldn't take him because of some physical problems he had. He tried to get a pilot's license uh, as a regular pilot. That didn't work for basically the same reasons. And so Larry decided he was going to come up with his own way to do it. And so I know that there's at least one pilot in here this morning and one air former air traffic controller, and so they're going to appreciate this. Larry decided he was going to fly on his own. And so Larry went and got one of those aluminum lawn chairs. You know the ones I'm talking about that fold up? And he went and bought a tank of helium and a whole bunch of balloons. And Larry started filling up balloons. And the plan was this. Larry was going to fill up a bunch of balloons, tie them to the chair, get in the chair, 
and lift off and float over Los Angeles. He lived, he lived in a suburb not too far from LAX. And so Larry did just that. Now, Larry was no dummy. He got himself some food to take with. He got himself a shotgun because the plan was if he got up to it and he wanted to come back down, he'd just start shooting out the balloons. <laughs> Genius, don't you think? <laughs> and so Larry did that. He, he, take, he took and he tied the, the, the chair to, his, to a vehicle, to his truck, and he started filling balloons and the, the chair lifted up. And he, oh, if three balloons are lifting it up, six are going to be better. And if six are, are making it want to go higher, we're going to add 12. And it just kept going. And he had this. Have you ever seen the, the movie Up? Yeah. Okay, picture that. All right. The, the, the balloons that were on the house. Yeah. So Larry gets in the chair with his shotgun and his snacks and his beer. And he lifts off. Well, he got a few hundred feet up off the ground, and he kept going. He got a few thousand feet up off the ground, and he kept going. And so Larry topped out at about 30,000 feet in his chair. And as he was ascending, the winds were blowing, and Larry ended up in the flight path of commercial airliners to Los Angeles International Airport. And can you imagine the, 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 the air traffic controllers who heard the pilots calling in saying, you're not going to believe what we just saw. <laughs> and so Larry started to realize that this was a problem. He was up so high, he needed to get down. They had closed the airspace. They knew he was there. And, and people were looking for him. And he started shooting out the balloons. And he started his descent. And he landed probably about a mile and a half from the LAX terminal. And when he landed, there was a gathering of law enforcement and media. Larry was quickly taken into custody. Not that they actually knew what he did wrong other than get in the airspace, because no one had ever done that before. And so... They had him in cuffs. They were taking him away past all of the media. And one of the reporters reached out a microphone and she said, Larry, Larry, why did you do that? Why did you do that? And Larry said, you can't just sit there. <laughs> and so Larry shows us that when you have a desire to do something, you have to make it happen. You have to be willing to move to get to a place that is where you are feeling led to go. Now, I'm not telling you to go buy healing and balloons. Please, let's get that clear. Uh, you people at home, too, don't do that. All right? And so we want to, but what I want you to think about, though, is you can't just sit there when God is nudging you, when the Holy Spirit is encouraging you and giving you guidance and direction. So, if you take out your Bibles, and I hope you have them with you, if you don't, grab, grab your phone and, and open your Bible app. We're going to be in Philippians chapter 2. And we're going to jump into a portion of a letter that Paul wrote to a church in Philippi. And like Joetta said, he wrote this and said some things and said a lot of things that you and I probably wouldn't say if we were in the same circumstances that he found himself in. I mean, it, it just, yeah. So anyway, what I'm going to do right now is we're going to go through the passage and then we're going to come back and unpack it. So join me as we, as we read Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. So, if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind. Having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man. 
And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Amen. So there's a lot in this passage, but what I want to do is I want to break it down a bit and see if it gives us some direction, if it, if it points us to what our next step would be. So, so Paul is writing, and he's writing this, as Joda had mentioned, while he was in prison, uh, but he isn't writing to complain. He's not writing to complain about his circumstances. He isn't posting on social media that somebody did him wrong, or that things aren't going his way, or that the government is awful. He is posting... He's writing to thank this church. This church had sent him something, had sent a gift to him, and he is writing to say thank you, and he's writing to be an encourager to this church. He's encouraging the church in their walk with Jesus, and in the midst of this captivity, he's writing to point out that it is Jesus alone that it is his true source of joy. From prison, he's writing that Jesus is his source of joy. So, verse 1 and 2. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. So here, Paul is saying to those in the church, he's saying that, if you received any encouragement from Jesus, and he knew that they had, then they needed to be encouragers of others. They needed to be different. They had received comfort from Jesus and from the love of Jesus, and he knew that they had, and he said that they should then be loving and comforters of others. He goes on. He goes on saying that, if they had been joined with the Holy Spirit, then they should be displaying affection and sympathy such as they were experiencing through that divine connection themselves. And it wasn't something that was just a few of them in the church should conform to. There wasn't a sign-up sheet out in the foyer afterwards. If you're gonna, if you're gonna be a comforter, we need you to sign up. It's not like that. He's saying that everyone should be doing this. They should do it because of the love that they have already experienced. You see, they needed to be on the same page, of one mind, as he put it, of a like mind. And just in case they hadn't figured it out yet, Paul reminded them by saying that because of this relationship that you have with Jesus, it changes you. It takes your focus off of you, and it causes you to be in tune with the needs of others. And with all of the distractions in our lives, all of the, the complaining, all of the, the unrest in people's hearts today, we need to be reminded of this more than ever. Verse 3. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but to the interests of others. Now, sometimes I come across some really interesting stuff when I do my studying for a message on, uh, that I'm going to share with you on Sunday. And, and this one, I hadn't had this kind of a, of, a, of a resource pop up in what I've been doing lately, so I thought I would share it with you. And it was uh, from Psychology Today, believe it or not, January of last year. And let me just read this article to you because I, I think it's, it's really interesting. It says, a new paper published in the journal Personality and Individual Differences. Now there's a page turner. It offers a new lens through which we understand cooperative behavior. Something the researchers refer to as, get this, others-centeredness. Others-centeredness is a tendency to put others' interests ahead of one's own that is based on a specific way of thinking says Ryan Byerly, a researcher at Sheffield University in the UK and lead author of the paper. He goes on, the other-centered person thinks that their own interests are just as important in the grand scheme of things as any other person, but they also place a high value on interpersonal relationships. 
Hmm. Because of this, they tend to prioritize promoting others' interests when they can't equally promote their own interests and another person's interests at the same time. This is because when they promote the other person's interests, they promote not just those whose interests are at, at, at question, but the interpersonal relationship as well. And, and so uh, you're going to see where I got the illustration with the kids this morning because it's about to pop up again. An example of other centeredness that came out of this particular article, according to the researchers, would be electing to give the last cookie to a coworker instead of keeping it for yourself. That's other centeredness. Even though you both would enjoy eating the cookie, the benefit you get from strengthening the interpersonal relationship by acting generously outweighs the benefit you would get from eating the cookie yourself. Now, I can tell you right now, I know people that would argue that. <laughs> I know people that would be all about the cookie and not so much about the relationship. Give you the cookie, you can leave. All right? But this is the idea. The concept of other-centeredness relates to other traits that promote cooperative behavior such as agreeableness, altruism, empathy, and unmitigated communion. It also relates to virtues like kindness and fairness. I'm like, I read that and I was like, you think? This is something that is mind-blowing to me. And let me tell you why. I have to say that after 2,000 years of Jesus teaching, and we are now just getting confirmation that this is right. Yeah? Yeah. So isn't it fun when science starts to catch up with the scripture? Yeah. yeah. Interpersonal relationships are what we build when we love our neighbors. That's what we are doing. We are relationship builders. Right? That's what Jesus came for. He came to build a relationship with you. And that's what's important. And ding, ding, ding. They're getting it. And it isn't because we came up with this idea on our own. Now, if you wrote a scientific paper, you might say that you discovered this. I would say you need to wake up. It's a result of our being loved. 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. We love because he first loved us. Your kids behave the way they behave because of the way you behave towards them. Mmm, let's see, yeah, Chrissy back to laughing. Uh -huh. <laughs> and then she'll go home and cry. <clears throat> Earlier in the same chapter, we are told that God is love. God is love. And so if God is love, and the reason that we love is because he loved us first, then we have one heck of a model to follow, don't we? We have a model to follow that when we are commanded to be, as we are told here this morning, others-centered, we are then doing this. We are in humility, counting others more significant than ourselves, right? It's what you do when you've been loved that way. When we realize what it means to be loved the way that we as believers are loved, I mean, we really get it. We cannot help but love other people. I would say that if you are a person uh, who puts others ahead of yourself, I'm sorry, let's back up just a minute. If you are a person who doesn't, put others ahead of yourself. If you aren't interested in being a help to those around you, if you aren't interested in helping those who cross your path, odds, odds are that you probably have not grasped the amount of love that has already been poured out upon you. You're not getting it. And when you get it, things change. When you get how much you're loved, you change. You can't help it. You just can't. People go to prison all the time and they have to pay the price. They have to, they have to pay the consequences for their actions. However, a lot of people come out of prison with a relationship with Jesus Christ because they are introduced in prison ministry to a love that they never knew they had. Never knew they had was available to them. So in his book, The Enormous Exception, Earl Palmer tells about a pre-med undergrad at the University of California, Berkeley, who became a Christian after what you might call a long journey of doubts and questions. So, about with the flu kept him out of class for about 10 days when he was in school. And during that critical absence from his organic chemistry class, 
A Christian classmate carefully collected all of his missed lectures and assignments. This young man took the time out of his own studies to help his friend catch up with the class. And years later, that pre-med student, who is now a committed Christian, told the author, he said, you know, that just isn't done. And I probably wouldn't have done it. But he gave that help to me without any fanfare or complaints. And I wanted to know. I wanted to know what made this friend of mine act the way he did. So I found myself asking him if I could go to church with him. Palmer wrote, the author, I think the best tribute ever heard concerning a Christian was the tribute spoken of this particular student. He says it this way, the former unbelieving student said of his friend, I felt more alive when I was around this friend. Do people feel that way around us? Do people feel like they are more alive when they are in our presence? I sure hope so. If not, we need to be more intentional about the way we share the love that's already been shared with us. Let's jump back into Philippians. Let's go to verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves. Paul's reminding his readers. He says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Some, some translations would say even slave. Being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So Paul is saying, have the same mindset as Jesus. You know, if you don't get anything else this morning, let's just grab a hold of that. Have the same mindset as Jesus. And you can find out what that is just by spending time in God's Word. Read what Jesus had to say. Read what Jesus did. So, Paul is saying, have the same mindset of Jesus, which, when you think about it, for believers, it should just come naturally because of the indwelling Holy Spirit. However, we have a pretty good track record of being able to kind of quench that spirit, to kind of push him down and say, oh, I'm going to do this my way. And then Paul says, if Jesus can do this on the level he did, you certainly can do it from where you stand. As we know, Jesus humbled himself, and Jesus is God. We don't have to fall, we don't have to go quite so low compared to that. He, however, put the fact aside that he was God, and not only did he set it aside, he took the status of a servant or of a slave. Jesus, you see, had every right to show up as a powerful king. He had every right to show up as a mighty ruler. But that isn't what he did. He didn't come to be served. He came to be a servant. And I'm preaching with no battery. <laughs> so, so we're going to get served with some new batteries. I believe they're in this closet. Yeah. So much for the energetic bunny. <laughs> All right. There we go. There we go. Just, just, just a, a, a really quick note that um, the, we we are making the most that we can out of the batteries that we have. The batteries that we're using are the batteries that we used in the. Uh, battery-operated candles two years ago during COVID. <laughs> right, and so when the pastor's batteries die, it, that's why, because that, oh. these particular batteries were for Jesus first. Okay. Right. All right, so verse, we're moving on. So Jesus put that fact aside, the fact that he is God. And not only did he set it aside, he took the status of a servant and a slave. You see, Jesus had every right to show up as a military leader, as, as a king, as a mighty ruler. But that isn't what he did. Imagine it's like this. Can you imagine yourself going to Texas Roadhouse for dinner, and you sit down at the table and your server walks up and says, Hi, my name is Jesus, and I'll be your server tonight. 
And he says, he will take care of you. He will make sure everything is taken care of. And not only that, but when you finish your meal and it comes to time to check out, Jesus also pays the tab. He does it because you could never afford what you just spent. Jesus shows up to serve and to pay our bill. Verse 9. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, Jesus is the greatest example of what it means to be a humble servant. A humble servant through coming to earth in humility and living in obedience and dying on the cross. As a result of that, God has highly exalted him. And when we look to Jesus, we should never forget or discount the fact that Jesus is God. Jesus gives us a great model for what it looks like to step up and to serve others, don't you think? And, and we really don't have, you and I, we have no excuse. Zero. You can, you can write some down, but they're not going to hold any water. I mean, if Jesus, the Son of God, is willing to humble himself to be a servant, to humble himself to the point of death for us, when we're still sinners, he's doing this for us, then what excuse do we have for not serving those around us? I mean, think about it. I don't care what position we hold in this lifetime. For us to be an Elon Musk and to step down and, and to help a, a poor person that they find on the street or somebody who is struggling financially or, or in a health crisis or whatever doesn't even compare to what Jesus did, right? And so where we find ourselves in our particular place in life, our stepping out isn't that big a step. It really isn't, and it shouldn't feel like that. And I'll tell you why. Because saved people serve people. When we realize what we've been given, it's not so hard to give it away. Let's pray. Lord, we are so grateful for the fact that you have shown us through so many different illustrations and through, through so many different uh, avenues that for us, to surrender to you and to surrender in such a way that we would serve those around us in your name is exactly how we fit in. It's how we respond to what you did through your son on the cross. Lord, when we come to uh, a place where we grasp who you are more fully and we are able to understand what you have given for us, it really makes complete sense that we would be willing to sacrifice all that we have because it all came from you in the first place. Lord, we know that today, today is a gift that you've given us. And may we be grateful for that gift. <coughs> and may we be grateful in such a way that we're willing to use this gift as a service to others. It's in Jesus' most holy and powerful name we all said, Amen. Amen. And so, if we look, continuing on, if we look in John chapter 13, Jesus tells us something that connects very much to what we've been talking about this morning. He says this in John 13, 34, he says, So now I'm giving you a new commandment. Go love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Doesn't that just kind of wrap up what we've been talking about all morning? Just as Jesus has loved us is how we're to continue on loving others. And I know, I know it's cliche, I know we're so tired of hearing about it, but you know, you really do need to ask, what would Jesus do? Maybe it's not so much what would Jesus do, but maybe it's how would Jesus love? Okay? H-W-J-L. How would Jesus love? Because here he is, the one who stepped out of divinity to rescue us in the muck and the mire, to give us a chance to go home with him one day. <laughs> I can't, I, I, I know no other story like that. 
I don't, I have never felt anything like that. I've never read about anything like that. I've never come across that kind of love displayed for anybody. And it should encourage each and every one of us today. And as we take of the bread, may we be reminded that it's Jesus stepping up for us. It's Jesus doing what he did that takes us to a place where we say, yes, Lord. And every time I say, yes, Lord, of course, I expect Christy to break into song. Yes. There we go. Yes. And so when we when we were reminded of that, of the physical nature, Jesus coming to be with us, and sacrificing for us, and we take the bread, is our opportunity to say, Lord, we get it. We're in. We're in. Lord, thank you for the fact that you sent your son to love and to live in this world. What an example. May we get closer to it each and every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. gotten to the limit. I'm sorry, I'm just not going to grow anymore in my faith. I'm not going to grow anymore in my understanding. That's not the case. And Jesus gets that, but at the same time, isn't it amazing that we have a God that not only wants us to have a relationship with Him, but He is patient with us with how messed up we are. And so when we consider this, and you look in Scripture and we are told that He did this, Jesus did this thing for us while we were still sinners. While we were still sinners. Isn't that interesting? That would be like the district attorney saying, while you were still out committing crimes, I forgave you. I gave you an opportunity to not have to go to prison. While you were still doing the things that would send you to prison. Jesus gives us the opportunity to have a forever in God's presence. And he did it by going to the cross and shedding his blood for us. It's what cleans us. It's what makes us righteous. Our righteousness is not of ourselves. It comes from Him. We only have righteousness that comes through Christ. To walk around and say any different is to be outside of who He is because He loves us that much. So let's pray. Lord, we are so grateful for the fact that You have given us a gift that we don't deserve. We certainly didn't deserve it when You gave it to us. And today, as we recognize it, we realize how grateful we need to be. And we can show that gratitude by surrendering to you, by being obedient, and by loving others in a way that, well, quite honestly, Lord, maybe one day, one day if we really submit ourselves to you as you ask, you will say, well done, good and faithful servant. There is no greater reward than to hear that. And we look forward to that opportunity. May you bless us. May you give us your guidance and direction. And may your Holy Spirit light a fire in each of us today that leads us to love others in ways that, quite honestly, Lord, we might even wonder about. Help us to be like that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
the foundation of our faith, isn't it? When we build our lives on the love that comes from God through His Son, it is what we can stand on. No matter where we are, no matter how rough things are getting, no matter how crazy the storm is that we're trying to live through, being foundationally connected to who God is through Jesus is what keeps us afloat. It's what keeps us solid. It's what gives us a place of unbending strength. It comes through Jesus from God. And today I, I ask that blessing upon each and every one of you. May you spend your days feeling as though God is right there with you, moving you, guiding you, strengthening you, and encouraging you through His Son and what He has already done for each and every one of us. A payment that's already been made. And He put the paid in full stamp on your heart. That's what happens when you commit your life to the Lord. If that's still something you got room and time to do and you want to give your life to the Lord and you want to move in that direction and get closer to Him, let's do it. Let's make that happen. We will talk about that. We will pray about that. I'm going to tell you right now, each and every week, after the service, I am available for one-on-one -on -one prayer. you got relationships you want to pray about with others or the Lord? Let's do that. You need to pray about your finances. We can pray about that. you got you got that one thing that's going on in your life that nobody knows about, and you need prayer for that. Let's do that. Let's invite God in to be a part of every single thing that's going on in our lives. Let Him walk us through those storms. It's a resource that we've been offered that we don't often take quite very seriously. And so this morning I'm reminding you that God says, I'm here and I'm enough. Bring it to me. I've got broad shoulders. So let me pray over each and every one of you right now. Lord, we are in a place where we need to have you show up in our in our lives in our difficulties and our struggles and Lord help us to open that door inviting you in Lord when the when the rain comes and the wind blows we want to be built on the rock we do not want to be stuck in sand and get washed away like the rest of this world Lord it's crazy out there it's crazy we just need the truth and we come to you for that truth Lord you tell us what it is we we really don't need anybody outside of you, Lord, to tell us what the truth is, because it's right there in your word. We are made in your image. You brought us to a place where we can be part of your family, and may we use your heart that lives within us to bless others and point them to that salvation. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Broncos aren't playing today, but... I would encourage you to have a great rest of your day. The Avs did win yesterday, so Colorado is still on the map. And we would encourage you to have a fantastic week. You are dismissed.